Plato's Apology. So let's start by looking at the historical geographical context around which the origin of philosophy or philosophy originates within the Western world. Um, here we see a picture of ancient Greece and uh, a few things that you're going to want to focus on is this particular area here which is the Aegean and we have Greece here this would have been uh, the areas of uh, which is now Turkey and here we have Crete uh, in particular this is Athens um, over here up here is, is Sparta in these areas and the, over here would have been Troy, Ilium where we see the Odyssey and the Iliad of Homer taking place now, uh, during this time, Athens, around 5th century BC, would have been the main power along with Sparta, and it's really in Athens that philosophy as we know it in ancient times initiates. Here's some historical uh, features to look at. Um, we have here the Bronze Age, uh, which is not really too relevant. Here's the Dark Ages, um, which would have been the time... Um, around here between 1200 and 1300 that we would have seen for example the heroes of Homer's Odyssey such as um, Odysseus and uh, Agamemnon and Achilles and uh, the war against Troy. Now over here we see Homer writes the Iliad and the Odyssey so this is a few hundred years after and so Homer's work is actually was actually handed down by oral tradition where we have bards going around and singing these tales and eventually Homer writes them down and there's some other relevant historical events that take place as well. Over here then is where we have the classical period. It's, this is the golden age of Athens and this is the age where we have uh, Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and then it moves over into the Hellenistic age once the Macedonians come and sort of take over Greece uh, things change and philosophy changes as well and um, also the Romans will, let, will will thereafter come into Greece as well. So pre-Socratic philosophy is the type of philosophy that originates in Greece before Socrates who is really considered the father of philosophy and uh, what, we, what we have during that time are not really philosophers per se because the word philosophy had not yet originated but what they were called wise men, or wise ones, rather. Um, isophi in Greek. Isophi, because the Greek word philosophos, philosophos is philosopher, and the sophos is the wise person. And these are the atomists, the monists, the, myst the mystics like Pythagoras, and others. And these are all sort of the pre the, those who were before, predecessors of the philosophers that would have come after. Um, and they weren't philosophers in the sense in which we understand them to be today, uh, they were wise because, well, they were scientists, philosophers, politicians, and um, poets even. And so they were kind of Renaissance individuals of sorts with various sorts of skills. Then we move into the classical age of philosophy, which is really Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And uh, these are sort of the focus of most uh, of the study of ancient philosophy in particular, for example. And here is Hellenistic philosophy where we have really a change that takes place in philosophy where there's less of an emphasis upon the kinds of theoretical inquiries that we see, in, for, especially Plato and Aristotle, and a, a transition to more Socratic type inquiry and also Socratic type behavior in the sense of living philosophy as a way of life. Uh, interestingly, Hellenistic philosophy is something which is kind of starting up today. We see a lot of philosophers going back to the issue of, well, we should be living our philosophy, not just talking about it. And finally, we move into what's called Neoplatonic philosophy, which is from about the 2nd to the 6th century, um, and really it kind of ends with the closing of Plato's Academy, which initiates around the 4th century. And we see individuals such as Plotinus and Porphyry, um, and C just, just so you know, CE -E means AD, Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, and CE means the Common Era, and BC is usually it was before Christ, but it just means before the Common Era. And the idea is that, well, look what's happening here. CE, philosophy, moves into the Christian era, 
And so philosophy becomes very spiritual in these works, and we also see something like patristic or Christian philosophy blossoming during this time as well. So in the classical age here, we see some major events which will figure into the apology dialogue. It's the recent overthrow of the 30 tyrants. So there had been a, a war formerly between Athens and Sparta in which uh, eventually Sparta won and they instituted these 30 tyrants who were basically Athenians who agreed to uh, basically tyrannize their fellow citizens and eventually the Athenians um, rose against them and they overthrew them and they instituted a new democracy which we see here. And so that new democracy is kind of where Socrates is going to be put on trial within the Apology for various reasons. Um, part of which are that we see that this new democracy is kind of in a state where it's not quite um, formed. Its roots are very uh, are very are not very deep, and so they're kind of worried with someone like Socrates going around asking people, "Well, you know, what's wisdom?" And, and a politician can't answer this. And they can't say, well, what's justice even? And so then people of, people of Athens are going to say, well, if you can't answer the question of what justice is, then how can you rule us? And so Socrates is doing that and asking these types of questions for reasons we'll discuss. And this leads to many people in, Demo in, in uh, Athens to get a little worried about Socrates, which is why he's put on trial, one of the reasons at least. So now, as I said, it's the golden age, the classical age, but it's the golden age as well and it becomes a place of science, economy, culture, the Piraeus, for example, big center of trade, and it's a port, it's a major port even today. And we see a large influx of immigrants, including what's called the sophists. Now remember the word philosophos, sophos is wise person. The word sophos was originally attributed to the sages, uh, and then Pythagoras would later say, well, I'm not a sophos, I'm not wise. He says, I'm a philosophos, I'm a lover of wisdom. Um, and that's 5th century BC, but when we get to about the 4th century or so, and Athens becoming this big center in an economy of uh, science and philosophy, etc., we get these immigrants coming in who are really astounding, amazing individuals, and they bring this new art of what's called rhetoric. And with this art, they start to train the youth and start to say, well, I will teach your children um, wisdom. And what they meant by this was basically how rhetoric, or the art of persuasion, and so the Athenians would then have these sophists, they would pay them large sums of money to train their students in how to speak and how to win an argument. And then these young people would go and they would use this in, in court and they would basically start to win um, in cases where obviously, you know, it, you have questionable results because they're using this art of rhetoric. And so this also figures into the uh, apology dialogue because Socrates is going to be charged, really falsely charged, of being a sophist. So, and here we are here, the sophists, they're teachers of wisdom, rhetoric, etc. Okay, so who is Socrates? He is called the Greek father of philosophy. There's kind of the grandfather, too, which is usually someone between Pythagoras and Parmenides, but he's the father of philosophy. Really, it's with Socrates that philosophy as such begins. And he is known uh, for going through Athens and asking very important questions about, well, in really moral questions about, well, what is justice? And, and he would go to the politicians, as I noted, and he would go to famous and renowned individuals and ask these questions. And eventually he would, of course, find out that well, these people really don't know what and have an answer to this. And this kind of gets people mad, and he is put on trial and eventually executed. And so he becomes something of a philosophical martyr. Um, now, one thing to note here, and this is Plato's Apology that we're looking at, that all of our knowledge of Socrates comes from his students, Plato, and another source is Xenophon. Um, but Plato is usually considered the, the main source, the more accepted source, authentic source. Um, so what's interesting is uh, Socrates never wrote down anything. So the picture we have of Socrates is basically what we get from these other individuals. It is important, though, to note that Plato mentions himself, for example, in the Apology Dialogue, and that he writes the dialogue 
during a time in which others would have attended the trial. So we can be pretty certain that Plato's Apology is a very accurate description of Socrates. We also have to keep in mind that during that time, the art of memory was well trained. And so Plato would have had a very good memory for these events and would have kind of stored these events in memory uh, and, and the ongoings of the trial so that he could give a good recollection of it. So the Apology Dialogue, apparently, as the scholars uh, would have us understand, is an authentic account of um, Socrates. Now, its account of the trial of Socrates, and the word apology from apologia means defense. Uh, you should uh, recognize that today we use the word apology when we want to say sorry, but during that time the Greek original notion is, is a defense. And for example, Christian um, writers would often write an apology for Christianity, which and they didn't mean that, well, I'm sorry for Christianity, they meant a defense. And so the dialogue, as I said, was written by Plato, a student who was at the actual um, trial itself. And so we have these false accusations, which we'll talk about, and they're fear-based. As I said, the Athens was a newly formed democracy. Uh, the accusers were part of this, and they feared that uh, Socrates was debilitating it. I mean, some other reasons, too, are that Socrates... He was basically making, um, in his questioning, he was humiliating the, these very powerful people. So you could imagine if you go around and start to humiliate intellectually, too, to humiliate them intellectually, very powerful people, you're probably going to have problems. And so we see this in, in, our, in our modern democracies, too, where people who go against powerful people end up you know, really having a bad time with it. And so he kind of has a similar situation. Uh, in the end, the accusations are quite false. Socrates is a very uh, humble, moral individual, and this really comes out after the execution when his students, like, like Plato, for example, write something like this. And it's not just an apology, a defense of Socrates. It's a defense of, of Socrates the person, and that's kind of what the dialogue is about as well. So... The dialogue begins with these accusers, who, and these three accusers, Anitis, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the Greek name, Anitis, Melitis, and Lykonas, the ass is there, it's An Anitis, Melitis, and Lycon. They represent different factions within Athens during the time. So there are different types of jobs that you can do in the early in this ancient Greek life, they didn't have all these types of occupations that we have today. They, they had very limited choices. Um, but one of them was a politician, and so Anitas he opposed the thirty tyrants, and he's going to accuse Socrates on behalf of the carpenters and politicians, so those who are manual laborers of sorts and politicians as well. There's Melitus, who is the most inexperienced, and he's the youngest, and he will accuse Socrates on behalf of the poets. Here you can think also that he's accusing, the poet here doesn't mean just someone who writes poetry, it, they're also religious poets, so poetry is tied to the gods who inspire the poets to speak their words, and so it's also the poets and those of spiritual denominations he's going to be accused, for example, of uh, being against the gods in many ways, and he will be cross-examined by Socrates. When you read the dialogue, make sure you focus on that cross-examination because it really shows you the methodology of Socrates. And there's Lycon, or Lycon. He's the son of, uh, um, that should be Aftolikos, and who is killed by the 30 tyrants. And he sees Socrates as connected to them, which is a really false connection. We'll see why in a bit. Uh, but he sees that Socrates was kind of in league with the 30 tyrants who had been instituted by the Spartans to rule over Athens after the defeat who were eventually overthrown themselves. And he will accuse them on the behalf of the rhetoricians and basically the sophists. So um, Socrates will have also gotten into many conversations with various sophists, such as Protagoras, and there's a dialogue that you can read in Gorgias um, of, these, of these individuals and the discussions he has with them. And so they're kind of angry too. So let's look at the main charges, and there's three charges. Um, two are really... Uh, a main item of dispute within the dialogue. One is an earlier charge. Now, and the earlier charge is going to be from this interesting little picture here, which is Aristophanes, the clouds. So 
he's accused of being a sophist. In other words, making the lesser argument the stronger. And as I said, and I'll put this, I put this first here, that Aristophanes, many years earlier, now Socrates dies in 399, so this is 25 years earlier, um, makes a basically a comedy, which is a play about Socrates in which he's depicted as a fool and a, and a sophist, so you see, and a corrupter. So all of those charges that we see here are really going to be depicted by uh, Aristophanes earlier. So they had this view of Socrates in their mind, but one has to remember that this was also a comedy. And so as a, it was sort of satirical and sort of political satire, but it's a comedy of sorts, and Aristophanes is kind of mocking Socrates. You see Socrates being being uh, lowered down as a go as the as the the gods would have been lowered down within these tragedies and these comedies. And um, just as a side note here, if you've ever heard of the word Deus ex machina, it refers to God from the machine. And the origin here is that, and the idea here, sorry, in the modern sense, is that in a in a book or a film or something, when something interrupts the plot in order to fix a problem, but totally out of the blue. It's called a deus ex machina. For example, if let's say there's a spy film or there's, a, let's say, a detective film and they just not tying things up with how the crime was was caused. And then finally they, they throw in this weird thing such as aliens did something to cause it when there was no connection to that at all within the actual film. That would be a deus ex machina. And so the deus ex machina, the God from the machine, is that the hoisting of the person down, coming down as a god from the machine into the play. And so Socrates is sort of depicted as this god coming down here. The second is impiety, asevia. And uh, impi piety was very important to the um, Athenians and to the ancient Greeks. One had to be pious toward the gods. The gods were the giver of, of, of right and wrong and just things. And so Socrates will at times teach things and doubt things that we see in the religious texts of the ancient Greeks. For example, Homer's Iliad, uh, the Odyssey, we see Hesiod's Theogony. Now, the problem here is that we see the gods often disagree with one another. For example, Zeus was well known. He was married to Hera, and Zeus is the king of the gods, of the Greek gods, and Hera was his queen. And he was often seen to be kind of to flander about and to go philander about and to, well, bind maidens and have various relations with them. And uh, Hera would not be very happy with this. And so we would see the gods would disagree and sometimes the gods would get into fights as well. And Socrates would say, well, this is ridiculous, you know. If the gods are the gods and they're perfect and they, and they have views about what's just and unjust, then they shouldn't disagree. And also we see things like Zeus going and doing, you know, really not very good things like raping young women, uh, you know, having intercourse with them uh, when when they don't say yes to this. And so, and he would say, this is not something a god would do at all. And in saying these things, however, he is kind of uh, showing disbelief in the gods of the city because he's saying the texts and how they're depicting the gods are not accurate, right? And so this is his accusation. Uh, just as a side note, too, he will also say things which are introducing concepts from the natural sciences, and of course the sciences, natural sciences have not been well developed then, and so they'll say, well, you, you know, you say that Zeus is not the cause of thunder and lightning, but rather the clouds are, and this is where actually this, this particular text comes from, because, well, this is uh, Aristophanes' Uh, jeering Socrates, laughing at, at, at Socrates for saying that, no, it's the clouds that cause thunder, and actually he was right. Um, and so this is another example of doing things that are not spiritual. And the third is that, well, he's teaching them to the youth. And so the young people of Athens, uh, one thing to remember here is that the Greeks, you know, held most of their activities outside. They had a very nice climate, even in the winter. It doesn't get too, too cold. And so most of their time was outside in, in the Agora, the marketplace, or at the Stoa, which is the portico where they would walk around in the shade, for example. And they would have discussions, and the young people of Athens would follow along and listen to these discussions with them. And especially with Socrates, they would love to see Socrates talking to some arrogant politician and in conversation showing that uh, leading this this politician into a contradiction regarding his views about well what justice is and what it means to rule others and of course the politicians would get angry and the young people would love this 
and they would laugh. And but then they would take Socrates's methodology, his what's called the elenchus, or his method of cross examination, and they would start to practice it themselves. And so this started to piss, get people really mad, piss them off. So let's look at his basic defense. Excuse me. So the first is his defense against sophistry. And uh, just so you know, these particular, the way I'm setting this up is a bit artificial, but it gives a basic structure to the response that he gives, which is really not structured in this way. It's more of a longer response that he gives within the text, as you'll see. So the first is that he says, well, his speakers generally like to place beauty before truth, but he places truth before beauty. Now, the sophist, remember, is someone who teaches rhetoric and and supposedly wisdom, but rhetoric really, which is the art of persuasion. When you persuade someone, you do so by making them believe that your argument is true. And one way to do this is making a beautiful speech, something that sort of... Um, appeals to their spirited part, to the part of them that gets their morale, etc. And so it seems so true because it feels so good and the words are so beautiful. But in the end, if you analyze the actual speech, you see, well, it's really not a very strong argument that's presented. And so Socrates says, well, the sophists do that. They place beauty for, before truth. Instead, he places truth before beauty. And so, as I said, the art of persuasion is tied to that. Now, this, this is one argument he gives against sophistry. He says, well, the sophists you know, seek to persuade through beauty. I seek to persuade through truth. Okay? And the second is, he says, look, the sophists, they charged you know, extravagant fees. And if I were a sophist and so popular as, as I am, wouldn't I be wealthy? But in fact, he is quite impoverished. And uh, he uses this as evidence showing that, well, he cannot be a sophist. And it's, fa it's fairly good evidence in that case. So the second one is against impiety. And here is really a very important event which is discussed because it, it, it is many ways tied to the event which originates philosophy itself in ancient Greece. Now the Pythia here is the Oracle of Delphia, and the Pythia is the priestess, as we see here. And so uh, the Oracle of Delphi was um, an Oracle priestess in Delphi, which is a, a, a city in Greece, a small town or city, in which there was a temple there on Mar Mount Parnassus. And the Oracle was well known in the ancient world for giving various um, prophetic pronouncements. For example, kings would go to her, such as Croesus, and he asked, um, I will have a great battle tomorrow. And he asked the Oracle, well, who will win? And she says that you'll just, a, a great empire will be destroyed. And he accepts that and he goes off very happy and lo and behold, the next day, a great empire is destroyed, which is his, his empire. Well, uh, so we see some ambiguity there. Uh, well, in fact, the priestess was so well known that by around the first century AD, we see Paul, St. Paul, uh, who features the New Testament, uh, he will actually cast, apparently cast the demon out of the Pythia, the priestess in, in a different town. There, was, there, there were other ones, but he apparently cast the priestess out because she was walking behind him, uh, prophesizing. He said, that I've had enough, and he turns around and he casts out the priestess. And this is actually in the Acts of the Apostles, if you're interested in reading that. So anyhow, his, a friend of Socrates goes to the oracle and asks, is any man wiser than Socrates? And, I, and Socrates responds, uh, sorry, she responds, no one is wiser. Now, I showed you this previous example because the article usually offers a very ambiguous response. And here it seems quite clear. But in fact, um, Socrates hears this. And Socrates is a very humble person. And he says, well, how can I be wise because I know that I am not wise? In other words, how can an unwise man, myself, be wisest? And this leads to what's called his divine mission. And he says, what I'm going to do is show that the oracle is wrong. Um, as a side note, no one really kind of latches onto this, but one could consider that idea of refuting the oracle to be impious. 
We'll skip that for now because it's really not touched upon. But you see that there. So it leads to his divine mission, and so he goes through Athens seeking a wiser person, practicing his method of cross-examination, and thus philosophy begins. So one can almost see that philosophy, if we look at it in this context, has a divine origin, that philosophy begins with the gods saying quite ambi ambiguously that Socrates is wisest, knowing that he will not accept that, and then leading him to inquire into what wisdom is and, well, who is wise, if anyone. And so this begins philosophy as the search for wisdom, the search for the love for wisdom, philos, the love of sophos, sophia, sophia of wisdom. So the next, the third is against corruption. Um, uh, sorry, let me just, I, I forgot to state here. Uh, so the, the idea here is, so how is this actually, his action pious? Well, because the gods are kind of uh, con cajoling him to move into this type of inquiry. So he is inquiring as inspired by the gods to inquire. And so his actions can't be impious as he sees it. And so the third is against corruption. And so, as I said, the youth followed Socrates in his activities and they went around practicing his method. And so the Athenians blamed Socrates for this. Um, he also cites another thing, another some other points against how he's not corrupt. And he says, well, since I was young, I had this divine sign, this daemon. Notice the word demonic, daemonic. Actually, daemon would later uh, be sort of enter into Christian uh, theological thought as the notion of a guardian angel. And really what it is is a kind of conscience in, in this early sense, an inner voice compelling him to abstain, abstain from wrong. So he offers that as evidence as well. He also offers very concrete evidence as to why he's not corrupt. He says... Well, look, when we had some actual historical events, I refused to try the Ten Generals. What happened here? During the Peloponnesian War against Sparta, Athens, Ath the Athenians beat the Spartans at the Battle of Arginusae, 406. And the ships afterwards of the Athenians sink in a storm, and the captains are wrongly blamed and executed. Well, Socrates was asked to help the Athenians to falsely blame and execute these captains, because somebody obviously had to take the blame, right? That's the way it works, doesn't it, in politics. Um, he refuses. And so he says, look, I refuse to help them do this, so how can I be a corrupter? And finally, against the argument that he's in league with the 30 tyrants, he says, well, I refuse to fetch Leon from Salamis. So what happened is that the 30 tyrants asked him, go and get Leon, they were going to execute the man um, who was innocent and who had fled. And Socrates, uh, actually, when he was asked, he was with two other men. And he says the two other men went to fetch uh, uh, Leon and he went home uh, believing that he would face certain death because you could not defy these individuals. Um, luckily, the 30 tyrants were overthrown not too long after. So he did live to tell the tale um, in the end. So the verdict is arrived at, and so even after his discussion, and the verdict is a 30-vote difference, and the accusers now, and it's a guilty verdict. And so during that time in ancient Athens, the accusers and the defendant could choose a penalty, and Meletus asked for death, and the particular um, choice that Socrates makes is really quite memorable, because he says, I propose that I receive free meals in the Prytaneum. The Britannium was a kind of cafeteria reserved for Olympic athletes and other famous entertainers. And um, so his saying that I deserve free meals, meaning what he's saying is that what I deserve is to be honored for my activities, for asking these questions, for asking us to self-examine and to look into ourselves and ask questions about the nature of right and wrong, the just and the unjust, etc. Um but in the end, he settles on a small fine, and he's saying this ironically because in the end it's not going to be paid. And the purpose of this point is that Plato mentions himself in the text, which is to show the historical significance and accuracy of the text itself. So the sentences, sentencing finally comes. Now remember, in this previous section, uh, Socrates, after being you know, given a verdict of guilty, 
is then given the option to propose his sentence. And what they would have liked is for Socrates to say, look, I'll take, um, I will leave the city or I will never practice philosophy again. But he refuses this. Uh, and he says this in the text that, you know, to do so would be really to lead a life which is not self-examined. And really, and this is a famous quote of, of Socrates, the unexamined life is really not worth living. And so in the end, he offers this last statement knowing that he will anger the, the, the jury and they vote then for the death penalty. And uh, as he does not show remorse, the number who vote for the death penalty is greater for those who had uh, voted for a guilty verdict. And uh, so to them, it looks like he's being, well, disdainful, but in the end, he's showing his disdain, a philosophical disdain for death. And if you read the text, and I hope you will, of course, you'll see that he talks about death a number of times and how, well, death is really not something that we should fear because, well, in the end, we really don't know what will come with death. And let's say that there is an afterlife he says, well, I've been a good man as I see it, and I believe that I'll have a good reward for this. And he says, well, let's say that there is nothing in the afterlife. He says, well, why should I worry? Because I won't know it, you see. So in the end, he has no fear of death. Okay? And so finally, coming to the end of the dialogue, Socrates suggests that posterity will remember his death. And he says, death is easy to avoid. If you choose disgrace, for example, you can run away from death. Uh, you could flee and do the unjust thing but wickedness is not easy to avoid. And so he is remembered because Plato and his followers later opened the academy. And so here we see the death of Socrates. This is actually recounted in Plato's Phaedo dialogue. And in the dialogue, he discusses on life, death, and immortality. And you should read this dialogue if you ever have time. And he drinks hemlock or poison, which eventually leads him to his death. And at the final hour, he says in his last words, Crito, we owe a rooster to Asclepius. Don't forget. So a rooster is sacrificed to Asclepius in times of thanksgiving or at birth. And so at his death, his final words, which are recounted, said, he says, well, we should celebrate because whatever it is, we don't know what's happening. He believes that he's going on to something better.